Hello, hello. You're listening to Paradigm Shift, a podcast about turning points in careers, companies, and lives. I'm Ashish, and I'm joined by my co-host, Zane, and we're super excited to speak with Brian Ma today, who is a prolific investor, founder of Divi Homes, and serial entrepreneur to talk about his startup journey and many other things. Brian was early at Zillow and later went on to co-found Divi Homes, which was recently valued at $2 billion in a funding round led by Tiger Global and Caffeinated Capital. Brian also co-founded and runs Iterative, an early stage fund and accelerator focused on Southeast Asia. Thanks, Brian, for being here. Yeah, it's great to be here. So maybe we'll start with a background. Do you mind telling us how you got into software and startups? Yeah, I was one of those weird kids in the very beginning. And I think I just really wanted, this sounds really cheesy. I felt like I had a life mission. <laughs> and so I really wanted to figure out how to make like a really big impact on the world. I skipped high school. So this is during like middle school. And so I really want to figure out how to build a company when I was like 16. And so the first thing I did was I was like, okay, cool. Let me get into college, get it over with so that I can go start a company. I think that's how it all started. I remember going through the course syllabus. I went to University of Washington. So, cause they had this like early entrance program going through the course syllabus. I was like, okay, what is the th one thing that's going to help me make the biggest impact on the world? And it was clearly like doing computer science. And so did that. And then afterwards, I found the best route to starting a company, which was joining Zillow. Zillow at that time was 15 people. It was still called Home Auction Web. We didn't actually know what we were doing. We hadn't launched a site. And so that was kind of like my foray into startups. I just want to wind back a minute. You skipped high school. Yeah, I yeah, that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, Indian parents would like not stop talking about that. Their kid will be like 70. They'll be like, my son skipped high school. How about you? <laughs> it sounds more impressive than I think it really is. When you're 16, you have no clue what you're doing. And honestly, high school felt like the worst thing in the world. Because I would have to like go socialize with people. I would have to like make friends and hang out. I was like, I don't care about that. I just want to build companies. College was also really, really weird, right? Because you're like 15 or 16 and everyone else is drinking. And so you literally cannot it gave me so much focus because you literally cannot do anything other than like study do homework and like finish your degree wow that's amazing so i know you went to microsoft for a couple of summers and then you you end up doing zillow what made you join this 15 person random team i mean now we look back and zillow is this this monster and rich barton is this legend but how did you think yeah. about it back then it literally was rich as a legend right after college. I mean, I just had like really high grades, right? So like on paper, I look really good, but like, I don't know, as a person, I'm probably like not that mature. <laughs> and so I got like the Microsoft offers, Google offers, Google had just IPO'd at this point, right? The, the Facebook offers, et cetera. And I was like, that just sounds like a retirement job. Right. I started looking around for startups and I had no clue what these people do. And then when I met Rich and Lloyd who were starting Zillow or home auction web at that point, I was like, these guys know what they're doing. Like, I don't care what they work on. I just want to be here. So that was how it started. Amazing. So we could talk a bunch about Zillow, but I think yeah. it'd be great to hear about your startup story. So you, you did a couple of startups before of course, like Divi Homes, which is like a, a hugely successful company today. So tell us about those early days. Like what, were the, what was the, the first venture you did? What were some key yeah. lessons? And how did you evolve as an entrepreneur and a builder? For a lot of early founders, I think the advantage, I had two advantages. The first one was I was really young, right? So I, I could take a lot of risks. And I think the second one was I actually learned a ton at Zillow. So watching the company, just like, it was ridiculous, right? Zillow was burning, I don't know, two or $3 million dollars a month or something at one point. And I was like, what is happening? Is this how you build a company? And watching Rich Lean, fast forward, right? Three and a half years at Zillow. Zillow came, was like tw 12 people to maybe like 300 people. So I had learned a lot, done a lot of initiatives, all that kind of stuff. I was like, great. Now is the time for me to like go leave and like start my own company. I clearly know how to do this. So I'd leave, I start my own company and like literally within like two weeks, I was like, I have no fucking clue how to do this. <laughs> right? It's like, I don't know what it takes to like, I don't know, find product market fit. Product market fit wasn't even like a word back then, I think. And so I was like, I don't know, just like completely lost. So my first company, we did one big name change, but people will know it as decide.com. That website costs us so much. And it eventually sold to eBay five years later, but I would categorize like most of that company's journey as kind of like wandering, right? We were trying to figure out what would fit, what would not fit, what customers like or not. The eventual product was 
we were able to predict prices of products online. So this is around the same year that Amazon started using algorithms to price things, right? So if you go to Amazon and you would look for a laptop or a TV or whatever, it wasn't like a person in the back being like, oh, we should uh, discount it $200. It literally was an algorithm. And so I think the thing that made me kind of like curious and a little bit angry is like, you could check the site the next day and you could say 200 bucks, right? On something you want to buy. And the regular consumer didn't know. And so we wrote the reverse algorithm to be like, hey, come to our site, check it out. And you should wait two days and you can save 200 bucks. It was a very early use of like AI when like AI and wasn't even like a term that people use. It was called like big data at that point. So we built this kind of like really big data science team to do it. I didn't know this back in the time, but like eventually it turned out to be a really data science core strength was one of the reasons eBay acquired the company. And so ended up being kind of like a good move in hindsight, but like during the journey, you would, you would like never know. It sounds like you didn't stay. I don't know if there's a interesting story there. When a company acquires a company, you want it to turn out really good. And so I stayed. There's a period of time there. We wanted to like integrate it really well. But at the end of the day, I think for young, I don't know, still have energy entrepreneurs, like big companies, a lot of times are not the right fit. Right. And so ended up leaving. I was in Seattle at that point. I moved down to San Francisco where I was like, I have to build a tech company in tech Mecca. And so when I came down to the Bay, I was like, I know nobody here, like absolutely zero. And so I was like, I'm just going to build shit, right? To like, <laughs> to like meet people. And so ended up building what the easiest way to explain it is like Tinder for professional networking. You swipe left or right, you chat with each other, people start meeting. We launched it and it kind of blew up. So I think within the first week, we probably got maybe like 20 or 30,000 users. I think it hit this pain point where a lot of people in San Francisco come to San Francisco, right? Because they want the network. And so it just took off. At that point, I think I hadn't really super heard of YC before, but then people were like, hey, it's taking off. It's really early. Maybe you should consider YC. So ended up going through the whole YC journey, grew that company, and then kind of like, a, it was a three-year journey. We tried a lot of different things and we all eventually sold it kind of like as a asset sale. I think what was interesting in the early days was just how quickly it grew with Absolutely nothing, right? Like we're not like spending dollars on it. We're not doing anything crazy. And I think the thing that I learned from that experience is build something people want, right? And then they'll like spread it around and, and do stuff. The bigger learning I think from that experience is your company hits these saturation points. And the saturation point I think for Weave was the hypothesis was people moved to San Francisco because they want to meet locally. Right? Like I spend so much dollars, I go to San Francisco, I'm like networking and it's like, I don't, I don't want to meet someone online. Like I, I want to be there. I want to have coffee with them, all this kind of stuff. And so we ended up running into like just stupid issues to enable this, right? It's like coffee shops were closed. People can't find each other. People would like, I don't know, bail at the last minute, not because it's their fault, but because their Uber was late and all this stuff that was kind of like tangential to the actual like meeting. So 2017 or 18, we decided to stop because I was like, okay, cool. It's not going to be bigger than my first company. And that was basically it. Now in hindsight, I'm like, this could now totally work, right? Because like everyone's meeting online. <laughs> so I remember using Weave. I think I was one of the users on the later iteration where you like matched people and set them yeah. up in the coffee shop to meet in and so on. Yeah. Um, and it was great. I really enjoyed meeting people. I would do like one every couple of weeks, I think. And uh, yeah. it was awesome. Then you guys shut down. And I was like, wait, what happened? And I, and I still <laughs> wanted it. And uh, I've heard that from a number of people actually. So you definitely were onto something, but I hear you on like, there was enough friction in the experience that it was, yeah, it, it hit a, it hit a bit of a wall. Thank you. I still get emails now from people that are like, oh, I wish I had, I just moved. Right. I like, I wish I had this uh, right here. It, it was a great experience. I think. What was YC like? So that was sort of like your immersion into the Valley to some extent. So yeah, we'd love to hear about that. Yeah, yeah. YC is fantastic, right? I think there's no other way to get such a broad network of people who are just really smart. And I think the thing that YC brought that maybe I'll start with like YC gave me exactly what I wanted, right? Which is like, I come here, I know nobody. And all of a sudden I have like a really close group of friends and batchmates who are exactly struggling with probably similar problems that I have. And this like whole slew of alumni that I can tap in any point. And so I think the network itself is really great. I was kind of like in 
in this weird position, right? Where I had like sold a company before and then I know came in with more set like best practices for what I wanted to do. And so I didn't find the group office hours, et cetera, et cetera, to be as useful for me personally. That said, I think what YC did really well was it just gave, it gives you a lot of focus, right? It's the kind of like pressure cooker thing where it's like, you you have to you know, grow a ton and then there's demo day and then you start to meet a bunch of people. So, but I would like 110% recommend any founder go through YC. Unless they're in Southeast Asia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unless they're in Southeast Asia, Asia, which we'll get to. <laughs> <laughs> With Weave, it sounds like you had a number of these pivot or persevere kind of moments where maybe you hit a wall and you had to figure out whether to keep going or or pivot and ultimately you decided to sell it. How did you deal with those moments? I think a lot of entrepreneurs face those. What were some of your learnings? I think I'll start off with saying it wasn't just Weave, right? Like every company, literally the first, I don't know, six months to maybe a year to maybe like forever, right? You're dealing with these is what I'm building do people actually want this? <laughs> and so I think at Weave, I basically was like, you have to create a framework for making these decisions or else you'll second guess yourself too much. And so the easiest thing for me to do was just to time box it, right? So I thought about everything as experiments. And so every time we did something, we're like, okay, is this a two week experiment? We tried to put everything into like a two week experiment time frame, or is it a four week experiment or is it anything more than four weeks is like too long. And so you're like, okay, cool. Give myself two weeks. What am I trying to prove? And there's literally, you have to get yourself down to like one question. It's funny because I feel like at least like half of the planning meeting that you have on these is like, what question is it that you're trying to answer and arguing about that? And then at the end, it's like, what outcome do I need to see for this to be a success? And both of those questions are actually very, very hard to answer. If you see a 50% conversion rate versus 70, is that good or bad? Who knows, right? But I think deciding ahead of time is really important. And so the framework and discipline of I'm running two week experiments. I want to try to answer this question. Here's the success metric I'm looking for. If I see it, we move on. If I don't see it, we do this. I think that's the thing that helped me the most. It's to totally the scientific process, right? Very hypothesis driven. What led to Divi and how, what were some of your early experiments? Yeah. So most entrepreneurs, when they basically shut down a company are in this kind of like very fragile, vulnerable moments, right? Where they're like, okay, I don't know if I like, I don't know if, if we're going to make it. I don't know. I don't know if I'm like, am I just kidding myself that I'm like an entrepreneur and I, I don't know. Uh, maybe I should go back to Microsoft or Google, right? And so I think I had this moment when I was like, okay, cool. If I were going to spend energy doing another company, because it's so difficult, I have to have 110% conviction to do it. And so my criteria for myself is like, if I'm going to spend the next, I don't know, 10 years of my life building something, it has to be at least a billion dollar company. Before the two companies before were like, oh, what are Brian's problems? And how do I solve Brian's problems? <laughs> and this one was more kind of like, okay, what does the world need and how do I go about doing it? In the process of kind of like doing that, I also added another criteria for myself, which I thought was really important, which is what do I specifically, what am I specifically good at that no one else can do? And that led me back to kind of like the real estate early days, just because we did so many different interesting things at Zillow. So that was kind of the genesis of, of Divi. After I did this thing, I now call it a vision quest. I did a vision quest, which to me is, buying a one-way ticket to nowhere. For me, it was Asia. And then just absolutely doing nothing. (laughs) And then you just see where your mind wanders. You're kind of like, okay, what am I curious about? All this kind of stuff, right? And then you're kind of like doing research. For me, it was really, I, I did a lot of eating, a lot of traveling, a lot of like, I don't know, meeting people and all that kind of stuff. But what was interesting that I found was I went to open houses in all these places that I was going to on my journey. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe like, I am kind of like interested in this stuff. And, and so I got like much deeper. I was like, I looked at housing reports. I started looking at construction. I started looking at I don't know, all these different things. And then I think there was, I don't know if there was a turning point, but I started really getting interested in mortgages specifically because since I was ni- I bought my first house when I was 19 and it was just the shittiest process, especially the part when you're getting a loan. And especially when you have like really, really unstable income being like a, a founder and entrepreneur. And uh, this problem had never left me, right? So I sold that house, buy another house, another house, buy another house, helped other people buy houses. And like, this is just a massive problem. And was, I think at this point, I just had more time 
to think kind of like first principles, I was like, what is wrong with mortgages? Like, why is it so hard? And so I think one of the biggest signals for me in the early days was literally every day, instead of going out and like in Thailand, getting new food, right. Or like meeting new people. I just sat at home and started researching like every day. <laughs> and so I don't know, that was kind of like a point when I was like, okay, maybe, maybe this is like the thing I want to start. I love how you call it a vision quest. I think that's so awesome because entrepreneurs and I think even non-entrepreneurs, maybe people switching jobs, you go through this moment where you're like, you're kind of not sure what to do next. And it's important to kind of like give yourself the space to breathe and organically sort of like figure out what you're curious about. So one question there, how long did you take off? Well, how long was your vision quest? Because you seem like someone who's like, who skipped high school and is like always on the go. So <laughs> how, how long could you go without having something concrete to do? The most important part for me was at, when you first start, it should be indefinite. Your brain reacts by being like, oh my gosh, that's like impossible, blah, blah, blah. But it's just like, don't, don't care about it, right? You will find it when you want to jump back in much later. And so it was indefinite. It ended up being, I think, call it like three months or three and a half months before I was like, okay, I feel like I need to get back to work. And so that was the time frame for me. I feel like it'll be different for everyone. You went back to real estate roots, which clearly has been kind of a passion for you over the years. And you it's very clear you've invested throughout your life in real estate and had something yeah. in the space. And somehow you managed to go from mortgages are broken to the rent to home yeah. marketplace with Divi. And I'm yeah. sure there was a windy road there to figure that out because it's a very non-obvious insight. What were some of the experiments you ran? This one's super fun. Again, in hindsight, right? While you're doing it, you're like, shit, 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 we're never going to figure this out. So I did the same thing I said I was going to do before, right? So every single two weeks, we're like running these experiments. The hypothesis here is like mortgages were kind of broken because you had to go through all this like underwriting stuff, right? And all the underwriting was designed for someone who was buying a house 50 years ago, right? Like 50 years ago, you would buy a house, you basically stayed in it forever. You don't move, you don't change jobs, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So they're kind of like broken. And then I don't know if you guys remember like the IPO kind of like crypto phase, the, I don't know, this is when everything was ICOing, right? And everything was fractionalizing, et cetera, et cetera. I was like, okay, cool. Mortgages are broken because of underwriting and fractionalization has a ton of benefits to lending in general. Could we apply some of these interesting concepts to the mortgage market? Did a bunch more research. I was also working with Max at this point, Max Love Chen, founder of PayPal. Yeah. What was Max like to work with and what was that? Uh, the easiest way for me to explain it is like, I feel like I do hours and hours and hours of research, right? And then every single week I would go back to Max and be like, okay, here's what I think. Here, here's kind of like where I'm headed. And then Max would say like one line, like one sentence. And then the feeling I would have is like, why am I so dumb? <laughs> right? Like, why did I, why did I overlook this? Like one very obvious thing. Can and you I'd be like, Shit, remember yeah. any examples? The clearest example I can remember was Max had me go look at mortgage securitizations. The one thing he said was mortgages is just like a very efficient machine. And so that led me down this path of like, okay, who are the agencies? Why are the agencies doing what they're doing? Like, what was the history behind the government basically like taking them into conservatorship, right? And then how did the banks actually like move mortgages around? I think that was one of the main reasons where I ended up going, deciding that you just cannot disrupt mortgages. There are too many players. It's like, you can't like inject yourself into a system that's like already efficient because you would have to take over too many things at the same time. Fast forwarding the story a little bit, right? It turns out that there's this very interesting concept called a rent-to-own contract. The rent-to-own contract is incredibly predatory because these kind of like early day single landlords have been taught from these like books, right? That they buy from the library that that's how you should basically screw your tenants. And so, I don't know, I feel like a lot of technology is these things where it's like, the fundamentals of the actual tool is actually quite useful, but because people are using it in like a weird or like wrong way, it turns out that everyone like shies away from it. What clicked for me is you can kind of proxy a mortgage with these kind of like interesting contracts and you can start innovating kind of like outside of the traditional mortgage market. So anyway, that's, that was kind of like in hindsight that that was the thought process. Going back to your question, like during the early days, that was clearly not the, not the thought process, right? So I was like, okay, maybe ICO is a thing, right? So maybe we should like ICO or fractionalize the house. Maybe we should, I looked into ground leases, right? I was like, why are we buying like both the land and the building? Like maybe we can, someone could buy the land or someone could buy the building. Maybe that's a thing. 
we started looking at development. So we we're like, okay, cool. Are there ways to just start from scratch and then give different pieces of the property to different people? We looked a lot at uh, if you're from San Francisco, Tennessee and Commons, right? So those are like actual ownership of homes, but like four people own the home in the same land. We looked at vacation properties. I mean, everyone, everyone wants this. And we're like, oh, what if you buy a piece of like a Airbnb? Or what if you, I don't know, can like rent it out and share at the same time? And so, yeah, I, all in all, I kind of feel like there were 12-ish concepts that we went through before landing on rent to own. I know there was like a lot of research in these sprints. So once you got to rent to own, I think you got excited about it. You were like, okay, it's basically a mortgage. How did you then think about, do people want this? What's the demand? What's the market yeah. size? What's the mechanics? How did you work through some of those questions? My philosophy is the easiest way I tell if someone wants it is if they pay for it, right? So the early days was literally just like going out and talking to everyone I knew to be like, I'm going to buy you a house <laughs> and you're going to sign this like weird retro contract that I made for you. Would you do it? Right. And so it, it's all the kind of like early days scrappy stuff. It's like, we went to Craigslist. I asked my friend's friends. We tested, I don't know how many iterations, at least 20, right? Different iterations of like these landing pages where it's not just like come to my site. It's like, I bring the landing page to you. <laughs> and then I'm like, we did a lot of stuff remote. So I show it to you on the screen. I'm like, this is the webpage that I've I haven't built before, but it's like live. Would you buy this product? I want to say I probably talked to 300, I and the team, right? Talked to maybe like 300 people before we got one person to give us their financials, right? So they're like bank statements, their paychecks, all that kind of stuff. And that was like the success metric. Would someone give me their financial information to underwrite so that I can buy them this house. And that's not very high converting, assuming those 300 had some intent to maybe buy a place. Yeah, it was extremely, extremely low conversion. But it was also, I mean, the thing to think about is it's also a house, right? And so <laughs> it's like someone has to be at this like perfect moment when they are wanting to buy a house and doing this like life change. This is a long sales cycle. I would imagine like someone would have to consider this tool in reality for a while. Maybe you see this in Divi Homes currently that someone hears yeah. about it. And now it feels like a long sales cycle, but the trick is just talk to more people. Right. So it's like someone's going to be at this moment in time when they are moving around and, and trying to purchase the house. And so when did you know that you had something like you went through all these ideas and you decided on this one? And how did you get from zero to, you know, one and then two and then three and then four? Yeah. So zero to maybe like 10 homes was just absolute insanity meaning like it was pulling teeth right it was pulling i don't know it was pulling like the entire set of teeth from someone uh, <laughs> uh, it was just really difficult and then from 12 to maybe like even from 12 to like 40 homes right it was still it still felt that way where it was like you had to go and you had to convince people that this was a thing that they would want it all that kind of stuff and like, I don't know if people understand the scale here, right? 40 homes is a lot of money already. So it's like probably series B, maybe series B, like shortly before our series B. Each home is like, I don't know, in the early days, we were buying million dollar homes. Now we're buying, I don't know, 300K homes. And so a lot of money has been spent uh, during these early days. The inflection point, I think for us was, or at least for me, I don't know whether it's for everyone is, it just felt like things got much easier like you're not injecting yourself into the process as much and your numbers continue to organically grow and i felt like we saw that flip around the like 50 home mark around maybe like slightly pre-series b but yeah everything before that was just like crazy crazy and i'm trying to think back i remember talking to you back then and using the product and I know you had this nice website with a bunch of homes listed and you were pulling just MLS inventory and yeah. pricing it as like, you know, you just bought this home on a rent too and it would be X dollars a month and this would be the terms, which I thought was really clever. And you, I think you ran some Facebook ads, or at least I remember seeing some, which probably yeah. got a bunch of email addresses for email marketing and so on. And I think you were able to get brokers to use this as a way to close more sales. Right? I think you could go to brokers and all of that, it sounds like it started to click once you had about 50 sales and you, you saw signs of it and it wasn't all kind of working together till you got to. Yeah. I'm jealous of other people who like feel like there's like one moment in time, right? Where like something clicked and then I don't know, something took off. 
I don't feel like there was anything like that for us, right? It was like, we work really hard on the broker channel. We work really hard on trying to like sell people. We work really hard on even like home inspections, right? We're like, we can't buy like bad homes. We work really hard on like at least five or six different vectors where it's like, it's not clear that these are the right things to do or the right processes or whatever. And then again, like series B-ish, I kind of feel like it all came together and none of us realized this, right? It was just kind of like numbers kept getting better. And every, every single week you're like, what happened? <laughs> you're like, how, how did the numbers go up? And then you're, you're just like innovating with like demand. So, so till, the, till the B, it sounds like it was a little bit like touch and go. So what was your framework? Sounds like you've, you've been a very structured sort of person in how you yeah. approach a lot of these things. So yeah. what was your, your operating framework or how you structured that yeah. part of the journey? Yeah, I think maybe the thing that was interesting about Divi, and maybe it's different for other people, right? It's like, actually, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's applicable to a lot of fintech is everyone wants a house and everyone comes in. And I think one of the things that was non-obvious to me was they're willing to go through whatever it takes to get a house. And so initially I was like, oh, we need to like optimize our application funnel, right? We need to like do all this like standard and other product stuff that you would do as like a SaaS company. No, nope, yeah. nobody cares. Your application can be really, really crappy and they would still go through it and they would call you. They're like, I really want this house. And so our biggest problem was basically how do you find qualified people <laughs> to buy a house for it? Not so much kind of like, do people want a house? I feel like the early days, we saw a lot of people come in. So the volumes were really high and they kept on increasing. Mm -hmm. And then things were breaking at the funnel, every That's part of the funnel, right? So it's kind of like, initially it was the top of the funnel was broken. Then it was kind of like the middle of funnel meeting. Like we had to call people, we had to explain it. We had to be like, okay, what, what is this actual program? And it was really hard for us to, I mean, no one understood understands rent to own when we hire employees like barely anyone understands rent to own so we have to teach ourselves teach them teach the customer etc so we have to solve that problem and then if you map out kind of like divvy's history i feel like you can progressively follow the stages of the funnel that were broken <laughs> And then we just systematically went down and fixed each one, right? So like home inspections was broken at one point, then sales was broken, then ops was broken, then et cetera. You knew there was demand. A lot of people wanted it. And then you had to systematically make the entire... Yeah. For some reason, I remember you guys having a big focus in the Midwest at some point. Did you yeah. in the Midwest? Was that where you were buying your first few $1 million homes? Yeah. So really new mistake, right? In the early days, no one other than open door, no one else is buying homes all cash like we do. And so because I was from Seattle, I was like, and I had a broker's license in Seattle. I was like, we're going to sign Seattle. Seattle homes are red hot, right? They're about a million dollars each. We thought we were going to buy a million dollar homes. And then we started like I don't know, getting out priced. And so we ended up buying a couple homes, not actually in Seattle. <laughs> They're kind of like in the outskirts. <laughs> and so at one point we were like, is this just like a really bad play? Like, it, does this look very different than an open door? The answer was obviously yes, right? So did this like huge study on what metro areas would work. It turns out we looked at a bunch of different factors. Uh, it turns out the thing that is most important for our model is rental yields, right? You can think about us as landlords. And so the best places for rental yields is not San Francisco, New York, Seattle. It's in these like third tier cities. So Ohio was really good. Now we're in 16 markets. But yeah, I think that was one of the points when we we're like, okay, now we need to go. The demand is kind of there. Now we need to go figure out how to get the unit economics to work. So that was the that was the play there. And I know real estate prices have risen a lot in the Midwest and I mean everywhere, right? In the last few years. How has that affected what you guys do? Have you been able to borrow at lower rates and offset that? Or what's sort of been your approach to that? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is our homeowners are really happy. So they're the ones that are like buying up the houses. And so, yeah, we, we share an equity. They get a bunch of equity. On the interest rate part, I think I didn't understand this in the, uh, when we first started, but when you operate at scale, you can get these kind of like interest rates gains, optimizations. When you're a small startup like us, your rates stuck. Nobody's going to give you that money for that low rate anyway. And so now it matters because we are much bigger. But in the early days, it was like, any improvement is a good improvement uh, on the rates side. So one more question about Divi, and yeah. then I think uh, I'd love to talk about mm, but, yeah. I know raising debt was a big obstacle for you to go from 10 to 40 and then 40 to like the hundreds of homes. Yeah. And I know today you're probably buying like hundreds of homes a week or a month or whatever, and you yeah. guys 
this really successful company. How did you raise debt when you first started out? And would love to hear about some of the war stories there. Okay, two things. Raising debt is just like raising equity, right? Where it's like you go to people and you ask for money and then they say no, 90, 95% of the time. And then I think the difference that I didn't fully appreciate is raising equity is all about vision, mission, like life-changing disruption. How this, How is this going to be really big? Raising debt is all about we're not doing anything new. This is very safe, right? We're going to get you back your money. Here's how the money works. I didn't fully appreciate that. So I think early days failed a lot. I also had an amazing co-founder, Adina, who is now CEO of the company. And uh, she was one of the early people that raised at Foursquare, right? So already kind of like had a superpower kind of like in-house for debt fundraising. The short story is it's like every fundraise story, right? Like you go to a million people out of 95% of them say no. And in the early days, no bank's going to give you money, right? So it's like Max and Friends. (laughs) <laughs> so it's like, go to all the rich people, you know, and they gave us our first, I don't know, two, $3 million line. I think one advantage we had was these are houses. And so even though the lines are really large, it's like, you probably won't lose money on a house because you can go sell the house, yeah, et cetera. Awesome. And so I think we had a semi unfair advantage uh, at the start. You recently left Divi Homes and now you're exploring your next chapter. Maybe you can talk a bit about iterative and how you yeah. arrived at it. For context, it's been about a year. I'm on the board of Divi, so do important but not day-to-day stuff. I think the biggest thing for me was, it was kind of weird. So I had a CEO coach, right? When I was uh, growing the company, by the way, love CEO coaches. They just add so much to helping you kind of like grow the company. One of the things that I think entrepreneurs don't appreciate enough is like your company's only going to grow at the pace that you are growing. And so I don't know. I, I just feel like for, for someone going through the kind of like hyper growth stage, being very self-aware of like your weaknesses and strengths are, are really important. And then CEO coaches kind of like help with this. One thing that my CEO coach said that like really resonated with me, she was like, hey, Brian, do you realize that you spend all of your Saturdays investing and helping entrepreneurs? Why do you do this? And I was like, oh, I mean, I clearly knew I was doing this, right? But it didn't like have a second thought about it. And it was because... One, I just found it really fulfilling. And two, I use it as like my reset button, right? Because it's like the running the startup was really hard. And then doing it on my weekends was my reset. Like, I don't know, some people go to the gym. Some people like, I'm going to run with their dogs. Some people do something. I, I like invest in, I don't know, in founders and try to help them out. And so my thought here was like, why don't I do this seven days? So that that was how it started. And and then it led me down to this kind of like, okay, cool. What would it take to be like a professional investor? Because I I just invested, angel invested before. And I decided to make the switch to professional investing. The story here is last year started Iterative, which was my pilot fund to go invest in founders in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is just really, really interesting because... I feel like it's in, at this inflection point where there's so much opportunity. Just to give people some context, the middle class is growing like gangbusters. Like people have never had money before in their lives, right? Nobody knows how to use a desktop, but they're on their phones. They're having a bank account for the first time in their lives. They are like getting auto loans for the first time in their lives. They click a button and then groceries come to them. It's like mind blowing, right? Your first time like getting online and I don't know if the internet like comes to you. They are learning stuff from like YouTube. And the thing that occurs to me is like tons of opportunity, but not enough founders to go after them. And so we thought the best kind of like product market fit thing here to do was take me and my co-founder from my first company, Suken, is doing this, to take our skills building companies and being like, hey, cool, can we apply ourselves and help other founders do the same there? Lots of stuff we can go into, but I feel like this is the right time to build like the support network that we all love in the Bay Area that doesn't exist really anywhere else. And how did you think about approaching investing in Southeast Asia? Why did you decide to start a fund? And with this, you can maybe talk, you can talk more about the program you're doing. It's kind of YC like, how did you yeah. choose that approach versus like traditional venture versus angel versus, you know, incubation yeah. or something else? Yeah. I Me and Sukan were just like, we're just operators, right? It's like, I don't know how to be a good investor, but we definitely know how to operate, right? <laughs> so what can we do that applies our kind of like skill set to helping other founders and being like an accelerator was just so obvious. So I think right now I feel like still maybe like 65% of my job is operating. It just feels like running, I don't know, 20 ish companies. We've invested now in 40, 45 companies. It feels like helping 
20 companies at the same time versus doing one. And so my job hasn't shifted that much. I don't know. I feel like I've learned a lot in the last year, just ramping up on like, what does it mean to run a fund? How do you go raise some LPs? All that kind of stuff. Some of these growth markets like India, Southeast Asia, China, less so now, but five years ago, are just so interesting. It's just bursting at the seams, right? And it, I'm almost like surprised there isn't more of a focus there. Like I invest in YC companies and we've done some together, right, Brian? And I'm yeah. always like most excited about these emerging market companies because they're growing the fastest. Exactly. So, so why Southeast Asia? Do you have a personal connection to that market? Because sometimes that helps. Was, was that part of it? So I was one of these weird kids where my dad and my dad's side family is still in Hong Kong, right? So would go back to Hong Kong around every year. And then it gets boring after a while because you're always going to the same place. And so we started traveling more, right? So it's kind of like Malaysia, Thailand, all that kind of stuff. So my main connection is food, <laughs> not like startups. So you can live there full time. And so we had been doing angel investing together. So that was a good market for us. The other thing is like, if you're starting an accelerator in the U.S., it's like, who wants to go to Brad's dinky, like little accelerator, right? Like versus going to all these different places. So there was just like no need in the US. So it, it just how, made sense. How did you, so how did you raise your fund? Did you put up your own capital initially? Like how do you uh, put together a pool of capital, especially yeah. for a foreign market, right? And some would say a small market, although Southeast Asia collectively yeah. is probably big, but depending on the country and the language. How did you approach that? How was that process? Process sucks. Uh, <laughs> but how I approach it was just, it's interesting because I was uh, doing a podcast on fundraising last week and I didn't realize this, but I've been for like 15 years of my life, I've been fundraising every like 18 months. Right. And so I just did exactly what I do. I just go at it and talk to a million people, right. And, and try to get money from them. The one thing that maybe most founders don't run into because they're not raising funds is when you're fundraising for a company, you need one person to come in. That's kind of like your lead investor. When you're fundraising for a fund, you need like 10 people to come in because no person will be a significant part of your fund. So that combined with a lot of LPs don't actually have timelines for deploying their money just makes it incredibly difficult to raise a fund. There's no secret sauce, right? It's just work really hard on it and talk to a lot of people and try to convince them that it's the well, thing. Yeah. You've raised VC, right? Venture capital for your companies. Yeah. You've raised debt capital early on. And I think it was like, now a lot of people raise debt, but it was a lot, lot harder, I think, when you did it yeah. like five years ago. And you've now raised a fund. I've heard people say like, one is harder than the other. Have you had yeah. a, an experience that's led you to believe like maybe like is, is raising a fund harder, maybe because you're a first time VC in a sense. How do you think about that? I feel like the skill set is pretty similar, right? So it's maybe like 80%, 85% similar between those three things. I do think raising a fund is much harder than raising for a company, mostly because for a company, I feel like you have your traction to lean on a little bit, right? And then you have your friends to lean on for kind of like warm interests, all this kind of stuff. For a fund, it literally is like yourself. You're just kind of like telling stories. <laughs> you're like, you're like telling data, you're telling stories and you have this thing where you have to convince way more people. It's like 10 people instead of one person. So I, I do think it's slightly harder. That said, dude, being an entrepreneur is like, a hundred times harder than being a fund manager. <laughs> and so it's I don't know, pros and cons, right? Harder to fundraise, but like much easier job, I think. I have one last question on this. Yeah. Do you mind walking us through a success scenario? When you're starting Divi Homes, you're really conscious about market size and you want to start a billion dollar company. I'm sure your ambitions have not gotten smaller <laughs> in 10 years. What would you like iterative to become? With everything I start, I try to do like mission, vision, values, or whatever, right? The vision is we want to substantially move Southeast Asia's GDP. So it literally is, I think it just goes back to like impact. And so I don't know what it's going to turn out, right? But I, I do think kind of like capital allocation, helping founders, all that kind of stuff gives you significant impact. And so, I don't know, a quantitative way to think about this is maybe like jobs created or something like that. And I think, I don't know what the moves are going to be like, but we just want to be able to support the ecosystem in whatever ways possible. What it may look like, right, is raising successive funds that are much larger. We'll start kind of like at the seed level, we'll help a bunch of people, we'll scale that. Maybe we'll start doing A, start doing Bs, maybe we'll start doing debt, maybe we'll start doing more programs. I don't know what it's going to look like. I still have this kind of like weird fascination with uh, DAOs and ICOs and crypto, right? And so, I don't know, maybe some of that will creep in. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's going to be all about impact. So clearly you did YC and you've, you've learned a bunch of things there. How do you think this compares? So a couple of things that come to mind for me are, YC, until a couple of years ago, was very US-focused. Right now, yep. it's 
uh, a global program. Most of the companies build products that cater to people speaking in English and so on. How's your approach to Southeast Asia been given it's a more sort of like regional approach? How do you think about the different countries and languages and how does it compare to your YC experience? I think maybe back up a little bit and be like, what should an accelerator do really well? When a founder leaves the accelerator, I think they should have some inflection point turnaround learning story. That's what I think accelerator you know, success looks like. I feel like in the early days of YC, and I, I still now you get some of these things, right? Someone will come into like YC, have a business, might not be going well, and then all of a sudden they're like another business on demo day and then that takes off. Like those stories are gold. And so I feel like a lot of it for an accelerator is kind of like, how much do we help? And so what, I don't know if it differentiates, what, what we try to do is we just specialize in Southeast Asia, right? And then so the network is from Southeast Asia, the mentors, the experts, the like VCs that you work with, et cetera, are all Southeast Asia. And so what that does is it creates this kind of like, you, you build this I don't know, knowledge base or, or knowledge network of like, how do you do, how do you expand to markets? What happens with different languages? Southeast Asia has an interesting thing because it's like $1 million goes really far, right? So all of a sudden you're managing like 30 or 40 people. So how do you scale kind of like organizations? Another weird thing is like products look really different too, right? Than the ones we're familiar with US. So how do you do products in Southeast Asia? And so the answer to all those things is you have to build this kind of like expert network of people that know all these things. I was clearly not an expert a year ago. I'm still not an expert. And so the strategy is to lean on founders and to lean on the people we build relationships with to provide that expertise. And then in the meantime, I'm trying to learn as fast as I can. Uh, <laughs> to do all these things. So even stupid stuff, like people have to set up like multiple business entities in like different regions and get like, I don't know, regulated differently and do payroll differently. It's like a major problem in these regions. And so, yeah, I think it's kind of like specialized help for founders. That's amazing. I, I definitely see the need for that in some of the interactions I've had with founders from other regions. I definitely can see you really growing the GDP in the region. So congrats on that. Really exciting. We'd love to switch gears to hear a bit about your superpowers that you've noticed about yourself or things that when you go into a situation, you think like, oh, this is the thing I'm going to lean on. And maybe the inverse of that, which is like the things that you maybe delegate or you try not to do, because I'm guessing you've used this to be successful in, in your journey. That's a great question. I feel like I'm going back to my CEO coaching uh, sessions. <laughs> I can get myself really excited after I like go really deep into something. And it's very natural for me to get other people excited about the same thing. That turns out to be a really interesting and useful skill for fundraising and for recruiting and for hiring. And so that's the superpower I kind of like lean on the most, probably. The reverse of it, the thing that I'm like really not good at is it feels so it's dumb, but I, I get really bored of repetitive tasks, right? And the repetitive tasks aren't even, I mean, most people get bored with repetitive tasks, but it's like optimizing processes is actually quite creative, but like, I don't know, I just can't, I just can't like stand it for the life of me. And so stuff that's kind of like optimizations or maybe sales or whatever. I don't know. It, when I look over like financial projections, I like glaze over. <laughs> and these are like really important things, right? Like really important things for the company, but like clearly not strengths of mine. And so those are things that it's not even delegation. It's like, you, I need to find people who do those things really well to support me because they're clearly weak, weak areas of mine. That's great. Yeah. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you really love the idea of like creation and going, creating something from nothing like the zero to one. And then once it's got legs in the one to two and, and figuring out the financial models and stuff, maybe that's something at some point in your life you're really passionate about, but now less so. And maybe that's like what you're doing with Accelerate. You're doing lots of zero to ones. And then yeah. obviously you're not starting the companies, you know, get the team and infrastructure in place and they'll, they'll take care of the, those other things. Another question is, were there any people that are along your career that you feel gave you a breaks or moments which were key where someone kind of came and helped you out? I mean, Max is a very clear example. So HBF wasn't like actually really structured. I, I don't know what Max on me, but I was like the only entrepreneur working with Max at that point. Got to sit next to him, right? Uh, had kind of like these weekly defining moments. So obviously have to give hat tips to every venture fund that bet on me <laughs> in the early days. I mean, I still go back to my Series A and like decide, right? Or like Series A, Madrona did our uh, Series A, our Series A in like Weave. And I'm like, 
would I have invested in myself <laughs> back then? And it's, it's not clear. Right. So kind of like, I don't know, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the investors back in those times. So for Divi, it was Max and then Ben Dreesen helped out a bunch in the early days. There were very, very defining kind of like near death experience moments, right? Where the company could have just like gone to zero. Uh, and Andreessen came through and Max came through, Ray Tonson came through. And so, yeah, very appreciative, very grateful. It's amazing. And last question, are there any books that have been lastingly impactful for you personally or professionally? I feel like this is one of my weaknesses. I mostly read like blogs now and like sub stacks and not books. And so I've like my book reading has curtailed. When I was doing Decide and Weave, I think there was this one moment when I was like, I don't know, really down. And I was like, do I even want to like do a startup again? And I think the two that really helped me personally was the Zappos book right, on culture. For some reason, it really resonated with me that like culture is like the most important thing to build a business or like a large kind of like long-term business. And then when I read Steve Jobs' book, when it first came out, I think that was also enlightening, um, mostly because I felt like I didn't have the bad stories, right, of like how hard it was in the early days. And that was one of the first books that, I mean, now you have Ben's book, Nothing About Hard Things, right? But before, there wasn't any book that was like, it was so hard <laughs> in the beginning. And so, yeah, the jobs book uh, resonated for me. That was really great. Yeah, Brian, your background is fascinating. And I love how you've worked across so many different worlds, but at the same time, there's all these threads kind of interconnecting. Like you went to Zillow and then you did a bunch of startups and you came back to real estate and you travel to Southeast Asia to find your passion in real estate. And then later on, ended up leaving a real estate company you'd started that had done really well to go back to investing in Southeast Asia. So thanks for sharing your story with us. And it's really fascinating. No problem. It was an honor to be here. This is super fun. So appreciate it. Thank you.